Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John. This is many a true nerd, and welcome to Fear Equation, a game about trains and nightmares, which you might not necessarily guess from the title. I probably would have gone for Fear Express, but never mind. Maybe that already exists in some capacity. Fear Equation is a roguelike, and it's set in a train, and it's really quite complicated. So I put like a few hours into it already, just so I vaguely understand the game, and I'm still not sure I do. But it's really good, so let's have a look. See. Resident Evil Fear Equation. No, it doesn't do that, but I feel like it should do. Any game that has that bong noise really should have a Resident Evil logo on it. Okay, here we are, waking up, and this here is my train. So here's what's going on here. I've got a kind of a bit of a really kind of old school adventure game style control system here, which is using A and D, you can kind of turn from side to side, and then with W and S, you move forward from section into section. It's kind of... Yeah, it's really, really old school. But you can, Mr. Z, it's not like um, it hasn't been rendered properly. You can, using the right mouse, kind of look around if you want to. So I'm on a train. I own my own train, which is convenient because of the nightmare fog. We'll get to the nightmare fog in a second. For now, we're talking about the train. Yeah, that's... <laughs> There's a few things to go over in this game. Basically, as a starting point, there's Nightmare Fog, and I own my own armoured train. Which is good, because the wife always told me that was a stupid purchase, but uh, who's laughing now? Not her, because she killed herself two days after the Nightmare Fog rolled in. Yeah, sorry, post-apocalypse team is really, really dark, by the way. And this armoured train is good, because up here, in the captain's cabin, I am safe from the Nightmare Fog. The Nightmare Fog cannot get in here. Unfortunately, I have a small problem. Which is, I want to get myself, if we look at this here map, from here, where I'm starting off. This is all randomly generated, by the way. Every single map is randomly generated. This is kind of a it's fairly traditional roguelike in structure. Starting off from over here, I need to make it over to here. This is Sector Unknown, but for whatever reason, my character has the opinion that Salvation might just be here. Unfortunately, we've got a bit of a problem, which is... I've only got 10 fuel, and going at a medium speed, it would take, yeah, 36 fuel to get there, 27 if I was going to slow speed, or if I'm willing to go quickly, then I could actually get there in, like, yeah, I could get there in, like, under a month. Like, would get me there on the 14th of February, and it's the, and it's the 19th of January now. So I could get to Salvation in a month if I went really fast, but it would take 43 fuel more than I've got. Now, fuel's heavy, so that means, unfortunately, I'm going to need a little bit of help. And that's what this machine is. So we'll just head back over into the middle section. And we will see that I can launch a beacon if I go into this machine. If you've got no one on your train, you can launch a beacon to attract them. Mysteriously, even though you are continuing to recruit people afterwards, you never use the beacon again. But the beacon is just an emergency if you run out of people, basically. It's just a mechanism for getting people. And you can look out of the door and you can see that the beacon has been fired. And there's some lovely... Like, you never really, um... You never leave the train. But the game does a beautiful, beautiful job of, like, coming up with ways of representing the outside world. So the beacon went off and some people responded to it. Ah, lovely. And mysteriously, the people who just arrived have sent me a message through this little pipe system. So, hello, who have we got? We've got Janet Jackson. Okay, that that's fine. Janet Jackson just showed up. Good. Along with four significantly less famous people. Lovely. Uh, but they didn't bring any supplies with them. Okay. So, we've now actually got some people on our train. So, let's go around here and look at the carriages. Now, each carriage can hold 15 people for a maximum of 150 people on your train. But if you've got 150 people on your train, I really hope you've got a lot of food because these people do actually need to eat. Less people means you can do less, but obviously less resource intensive. So for the moment, five people to start off with is very, very good. But before we get to the people, let's kick off where we're actually going here. So this is my train here and it needs to go somewhere. These little kind of bits along the map are settlements. So obviously you want to stop at settlements because you're going to need to grab stuff. This first settlement here, uh, Montrose, conveniently has a gas station, which logically is a good source of fuel, as well as a pub and a hardware store. Excellent. So obviously I don't have much fuel at the moment, so I can choose to go slower in order to be more fuel efficient or faster in order to arrive there kind of sooner, but that burns up more fuel. So I'm going to start off going slow. There's not really much reason to go kind of too much faster than that. And the train does, by the way, now kind of throttle up and actually start moving. You've actually, you can physically do any of these that you want, by the way. There's nothing to stop you just kind of grabbing the brake and applying it for whatever reason. Then taking it back off again. You can fiddle with all the controls. It's really, really lovely. And if you want to just throttle up without even checking what the fuel is, at any point you can just grab the throttle and whack it up to max, which is lovely. 
So we're now going there and it'll burn a fair bit of fuel. But as we go along nice and slowly, potentially more settlements kind of show up because these are only the settlements I know about. It's always worth checking how much fuel each of these things are because clearly like this is a map that the protagonist has just drawn from memory. Just because like the line as drawn on this map looks one length, it doesn't mean that's going to represent how much fuel it's going to use. So you always need to double check that. Anyway, we're now very slowly making our way over there. So with that done, time to move back to our passengers and actually start getting them to work. We do that with the notebook. The notebook that tells us, you know, what our population is, how much food we have given the amount of food on the train and the amount of people on the train, how many carriages we have in use, and the amount of fuel that we've currently got, together with our upgrades, which we don't have any of yet. Let's go over to carriage one, which is where these people all are. So first things first, as you probably saw above the main controls there, there is the lottery. We've got to assign five people to actually be doing the hard work on a given day day. So obviously in this case I can just basically auto fill it because there are only five people so they all have now lost the lottery. So just announce, make an announcement down to the carriages. There we are. Obviously I really like this as like a story thing because it makes sense like later in the game why everyone just like lets you just stay in the cabin and send them off to do all the dangerous missions because it's your train and if there's loads of people on the train only five people are sent on dangerous missions the chance of them being sent is quite low so generally people have got a pretty sweet deal because some people might never have to do any danger whatsoever. Anyway, now that we've got that under control, we can now actually start assigning these people jobs. You can assign them as many jobs as you want, but like, they start to lose faith in you if you give them too much to do because they think you're not in control. So this symbol right there, that means that they are neutral to me right now. If I do things that they come to like, they'll like me more. If they die or I don't, you know, give them enough food or whatever, they'll come to hate me. And eventually, if they hate you too much, they might lead an uprising against you. So let's start off by doing some upgrading of the train, which is rather important. To my mind, an important one to start off with is the engine. The first engine upgrade is fuel capacity. So right now I have 10 fuel, but I can only hold 10 fuel. So potentially you might want to have more fuel than that. So I'm going to start these guys working on fuel capacity one. So I'm going to kind of basically put that in a little note and send it through my little wibbly tube system back to them. Because basically like... The idea seems to be each carriage is like its own little armoured town. They form their own little factions. Every carriage has its own like leaders. It almost forms like its own little weird religion thing. And the idea is basically they just keep to themselves and they'll only try and storm the train if they get really, really upset. So I've told those guys to start on some upgrades. I don't think you can get them doing two upgrades at once. So instead, I'm going to have them build some defences. But before that, we need to look at the dream locks. Because it's time to talk about what the fog does. The fog, a bit like something out of a Stephen King novel, basically is a terrifying, unexplained, supernatural thing that sweeps across the country, making your nightmares come to life and attack you in the night. Like, literally. If people in the carriage have a nightmare about something, then the following night, that thing will actually physically come and attack them and do harm to them, in the night. Though interestingly, people can only dream of one of five things, though the five things seem to be kind of randomly generated as you go along. So in this case, oh dear, a few people have been uh, dreaming about the carnival. So terrifying clowns will actually potentially attack them in the future. And pods, I've not seen that one before. That's interesting. So the, yeah, the fog generates nightmares based on dream frequencies. The severity of the attack is influenced by the fog density around the train. So... We now know that what's going on here is that this place might be attacked by the carnival or by pods, but more likely by the carnival. And you can actually read all of their dreams if you want to. The carnival's in town. One of the freaks, she's talking about a farm. Horrible things. They want to be me. Uh, yes, people are going a little bit mad because of the nightmare fog, which is understandable. So that means the other thing I need to tell them to do is build some defences against the carnival. So build some defences. I've got some scrap. So let's build some defences against the carnival, involving some open flames, which, I guess, scraps anything I've got. I can get, like, other materials, like um, machine parts, electronics, chemicals. If you've got electronics, then you can build loudspeakers, which apparently terrify the carnival, or a crop spray to terrify the carnival, or a gypsy out of mechanical parts, because that'll scare off the scary. Yeah, the logic doesn't always work very well, but... Um, Let's, for the sake of argument, just build some nice open flames in order to apparently keep the carnival at bay. So build that. So there we are. So on the same day, they've started upgrading the engines and also building some defences against the carnival that might come to town there. So that's all we really need from those guys for now. That's absolutely fine. 
We may as well, by the way, while we've got loads of engine charge and the carriage drawer is tiny, we may as well just kind of whack up the amount of energy that we're assigning to that carriage, which basically just, I think it just makes it a bit nicer to live in and a bit more secure. So you can see, like, that's that's kind of drawn a bit of the engine, but not too much. So I think we're okay for the moment. We should be fine, yeah. So that's okay for the minute. We can just, anyone new who shows up, we can shove them in carriage one. So we don't need to worry about the other carriages just for now. So with that done, we can now tap tab to basically fast forward time to the next event that shows up, which is into the work period. The work period is obviously the period when they start actually getting on with the work I've just assigned them. So that's absolutely fine and we don't need to worry about that. So we can now pretty much skip straight to the end of the first day. So we can just fast forward through some time. There we are. And we've now reached the end of the day where the passengers send me a nice little update. Because, yeah, I genuinely think, like, I've locked the door against them and they've locked the door against me. So, like, you know, we don't really get on very well. They just see themselves as, like, a separate little faction at the back of the train. And I'm up here up front, but we only communicate through the little... I don't even know what these are called. Little, little pipe tube message things. So, the carriage one has completed 1x open flame. So, they now have some defense against the carnival. Which is good. Because the thing is... Works over, and guard basically means the night shift, and that means it's 6pm. Meaning I'm now basically going to go to sleep, and I'm going to get up again at like 6am in the morning to begin the cycle all over again. You can see that we've kind of, we've moved a little bit around the corner here, but nothing new has shown up on the map yet at least. So that means now it's time for me to go to bed. Either they're going to get attacked by clowns, or I'm going to have a nightmare. I can't be attacked by the clowns, because as I say, the actual, um, the front carriage up here is the only one that's completely impervious to the fog. Back there, they're safer than they would be in the outside world, but they're not impervious to the fog, so the fog can get in. So they just go to sleep, and we see what happens overnight. I just kind of turn in, and fall gently asleep in my armoured bullet train in the middle of the nightmare fog. And we wake up, and it seems everything's fine. So that probably means it was a fairly quiet night. First thing in the morning, no one sent me any urgent messages, so that generally means, like, nothing's gone horribly wrong overnight. That probably means it was a nice, quiet night. And now the whole thing repeats. Though, obviously, if we kind of head up to our map, you'll notice that we have moved a very small amount of distance overnight there, which is lovely. The only other thing we really need to think about is the radio, by the way. We've got a radio that's pretty crappy when you start off, but gets a lot better kind of uh, in future. So if we go, like, into the comms menu, we can, like, select... You know, uh, messages about resources, messages about supplies, messages asking for help. So we haven't had any of those yet, but I think that's because it's the first day and we'll kind of start getting those kind of coming in over the next kind of uh, day or two. Now, ooh, that's a lovely little retro keyboard. Can you actually press the keys? No, sadly, you cannot press the individual buttons on the keyboard. That's a shame. Though everything else is, like, really interactable with. Like, if I want to just kind of reduce the power draw on the carriages, I can just turn them straight down to low, and that does actually turn everything down to power draw one straight away. Or you can put them all, whack them straight all up top. It's just lovely. It's just genuinely, like, it's a lovely tactile thing. It reminds me of, like, an actual train simulator. Because all the buttons and stuff, you can actually, like, push all of the buttons and just pull all the levers. It's It's got a beautiful tactileness to it. I do like it. Anyway, let's repeat this process over again. Obviously, the lottery happens every single day and there's nothing to stop me taking anyone I want out of the lottery, but in this case, it's kind of pointless. Though, something interesting has happened on the first day, which is these people have started electing a leader because they always elect a little leader. So their leader is Mildred Campbell. And she's normally, like, normally the most capable person just kind of becomes the leader. So she's got a lot of vigor and a lot of grit, for example. Now that's important, because the leader basically kind of sets the tone of the actual carriage. So these guys have now decided that they are, as a faction, the producers. They've also decided they like me quite a lot, presumably because I gave them some, you know, anti-clown defences. So they've now turned to a shield, which means they are now defensive of me. So they will now, if there is a rebellion, they'll fight for me rather than against me as long as I can keep them on hand. Because they are the producers, and because, you know, she's all about vigour and grit and stuff, they're now really in favour of building defences and upgrading the train, which is really, really good. So if we just kind of get the lottery done, yep, autofill it, dispatch it, it's exactly the same few people. Now they've now all shuffled up into this position. This thing kind of gives you that outlook on life, by the way. People who are to the north believe the terrible nightmare fog is an opportunity. People in the south believe that it is a terrible punishment. People on the left believe that it is a magical, superstitious -y type thing. People on the right believe there's some sort of natural or scientific cause. So these people are being rational and positive and upbeat, which is good. So therefore, they're being kind of positive 
and they're the producers. So therefore they just want to protect themselves and upgrade the train. So these, this is a really good carriage. These are good quality people. So yep, I'm going to tell them to upgrade the train. Start working on that engine capacity that like we said last time. But this time, now we tell them to do it. There's going to be a faction bonus plus 50%. They're going to do it faster because they are producers. They like upgrading things. So they're going to like me more and do it better and faster, which is really, really good. So I'm just going to tell them to do that and crack on with it. Beautiful. They're probably also, by the way, happy because I've given all the power to their carriage. As obviously more people come in and we fill more carriages, that won't necessarily be able to keep happening. So we have assigned them their orders so we can move straight on into the work detail. And we've got nothing new to apply. I don't think there's anything else coming up on the radio. So we can now move through to the end of the day. Then we can look over here and see if anything comes up on the radio. Nope, looks like nothing came up on the radio, but they've sent me a quick bit of an update. Ah, and they've completed the research fuel capacity one. Um, I've yet to verify this, but I believe if you get everyone to do, like, a single research project, they do it way, way faster. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's really, really good news. So now, if I go into my notebook, the train is now, yeah, so the train's fuel capacity has risen to 15. So that's really, really good. You can also see now that Concerns has popped up here, by the way. Now that Mildred Campbell is the leader, the carriage starts to pick up a personality, and every carriage has its own unique leader, personality, set of concerns. So she's not too worried about chaos food supply or injury levels, but she's worried about the level of technology. Um, so in other words, she thinks that we need to upgrade the train really, really quickly because she's worried about that. Which, you know, they're the producers. It makes sense that that would be their concern. Well, nothing new on the radio today, so we may as well kind of wait for something to show up over the next kind of day or two. Into bed we go. Let's see if anything happens overnight, like a clown attack, for example. Nope, quite night again. Beautiful. Ah, and this morning we've had our first little message come through on the radio. The radio picks up things that show new settlements, give you an idea what's going to be at a settlement so you can plan where to go and what to try and loot better but you can upgrade the radio so it gets better at it so yeah we've got multiple new messages coming in that came in overnight so um at half nine last night the fearless ones are heading towards the hospital fearless ones are bad the game doesn't i don't think it really ever really explains what a fearless one is but i think it's people who kind of uh, had so many nightmares they went mad and are now called the fearless ones they're roving savages i think you want to avoid them if anyone's listening there's a few survivors still at the gas station at montrose okay montrose is where we're going next that's the first big settlement on the way and the military are heading to the rail depot the military seem to be bad like for whatever reason the military bad i think the military want to like confiscate your train so they fire on it so you don't want to get too close to the military so you've got to kind of be careful of those guys and i think actually if we head forward to the map now yeah i think that there is new I'm pretty sure because that's circled in red, that wasn't there previously. So on this little sub-branch, there's now a rail depot. So obviously a rail depot could be a good source of fuel, for example. Because what this game's very good at is this game's very good at rewarding intuitive thinking. Things are where you think they ought to be, as I'll kind of show in uh, when we get to our first kind of little kind of resource gathering mission. But you know what, as we could do with a few more settlements showing up, I'm going to upgrade the radio. Because that means, you know, more calls and more detailed calls coming over your radio. So let's tell those guys to crack on with, the, uh, with that upgrade. They'll enjoy that, so it'll be done faster. It'll be a really good upgrade. And these guys are really specialising. This is what the leader does. The leader pulls everyone into their way of thinking, which is really, really useful. <laughs> oh, there we are. I just fast-forwarded through that day, and multiple new messages have started coming in. Lovely. So, messages for help. Get more survivors on our train. If anyone's listening, there are many survivors at a factory at the coordinates 10-6. And that corresponds to the um, the coordinates on your map. So, I assume they like give map coordinates, and you convert that into what is on your chart. So we've got multiple messages about survivors alive at a factory. Well, that's all right. Let's go and have a look, see if that's actually new. Yes, it is. Look, this has just shown up. A factory has just shown up, literally just round the corner from me, and they have multiple survivors present. So that's really, really useful. Now, I therefore need to go there, but I need to figure out the best way to arrive. Because what you want to do is you want to arrive during the time you're working because the fog is kind of sentient or something it's yeah it's slightly weird the fog is kind of sentient so therefore if you kind of arrive and then you wait for like if say if you arrive at like midnight and then you can only go on an expedition when the workday actually begins like 
whatever that is, like, um, seven hours later. The fog's basically waiting for you at that point, and you've got very little time to actually do any looting. So you want to arrive as close to the workday as possible, and that's why you want to use, you change your speed. In all cases, it will just use me one fuel, so I just need to pick what time to arrive. Don't want to arrive in the middle of the night, don't want to arrive at 1am. I'll go slowly, so I arrive at 5am. I mean, in the perfect world, you'd arrive, like, mid-afternoon or something, because then, like, if you do speed up, the train will just ram to a stop at, like, 2pm, the speed up will stop happening, and then you can immediately go on an expedition. So, that is all very, very good. So, go slow, plot the route, we're now going to that factory. So, that is now our target. Beautiful. Let's just check what they're saying about that. The research one has been completed. I like these guys. I like these guys. These guys are good. I like them. Which is a shame because next turn we're going to go and send them on a scavenging mission and they're probably all going to die, but never mind, eh? Right, let's go sleep. 5am tomorrow morning we arrive at the factory and then pretty much as soon as we get up we're going on a scavenging mission. Off we go to sleep. I wonder if clowns are going to attack everyone in their sleep this time. Because you can have nightmares. Night you just seem to randomly have nightmares that don't seem to have much of a bearing on the, um, the train. It's just, you know. Oh, hello. That's the train stopping. Is it 5am? Or is that me just kind of, uh, what time is it now? Hang on, hang on. It is, oh no, it's 6am, but I woke, I just kind of had a bit of a doze afterwards. Oh, balls. The fog meter is really, really, really high. So this is going to be a really dangerous first expedition to go on. Like, this is the point where you almost would sometimes... If there was, like, a settlement, like, right here, I probably wouldn't even bother with this settlement because this is... This is risky. This is very, very risky. Uh, but we'll, we'll give it a go. We will give it a go while we're actually passing by. So what we want to do as a starting point is we have to go through our usual business. You have to um, go and select your lottery winners, who are obviously the same five as always. This would be normally the case where you'd like pick your thing. Because like, what you can do is if you autofill, it's a real lottery. But if you actually want to just pick people who are going to win the lottery, you can. You can just rig the lottery if you want. So uh, this is the point where you would start rigging the lottery because you'd send your people with the best skills. Because every single person, yeah, we'll just dispatch that. Every single person has their own set of skills. Skills that are useful for the train and skills that are useful for the mission. So Mildred Campbell, who's useful at the mission, is going to be really good at searching. Whereas, let's have a look, see, this person's not very good at anything. Um, Richard Ross is really good at hauling, so he's good at um, bringing more stuff back to the train. Mildred's really good at finding lots of stuff. Um, he's pretty good at hauling, and what's your deal? You're really good at guarding, uh, so we'll get to what those do in a second, but we've got to kind of, basically, you've got to use people for the right thing. Anyway, for the moment, let's actually ask them to do some more upgrading anyway, because why not? You know what, I'll put them back on the engine, because engine and fuel capacity, and then subsequently fuel efficiency is pretty damn important. So they can upgrade the fuel capacity again, because if we can get a nice full engine of fuel, that would be gorgeous. So that is what they need to do. Fine. So with those orders assigned, we now fast forward into the work stage, and then... Over on our computer, which starts going yellow and bleeping like we've just mysteriously transferred from Fallout 3 straight into Fallout New Vegas, the machine is now telling us, hey, by the way, there's a nearby location, you've already stopped at it, you're probably going to want to go and investigate. So let's just check if by any chance the fog's cleared at all. Oh, the fog is crazy. <laughs> the fog is crazy thick. And the fog will basically eat people. So this means we need to get in and out of here really, really quick. Now this is, this is one of my favourite bits of the game. This is where this game becomes utterly spectacular. So head into this fight thing. Yeah, there we go. Let's just check our last minute notes that came in overnight. So many survivors still alive at the factory. Many survivors still alive at the outpost. Okay, we're going to check where that outpost is. That might be a new location. But for now, there's only one location. If you go to a town, there'll be a choice of locations, at which point you have to choose based on what you've heard on the radio, which you want to go to. So... Once you select a location, they will give you relevant information pertaining to that location. So if anyone's listening, there are many survivors still alive at the factory. There are 11 rooms, 1,412 square meters to search, six survivors, no fearless, fearless being yet the monster savages, we want to avoid those guys. Because there's so much fog, we've got to get in and out in 45 seconds if we want to be safe. If we don't want to be safe, we can hang around longer, but that's the point where the fog gets angry. Yeah, I think you, you'll see that soon enough. So obviously we've got these five people and right now we don't have any special things to um, to award to them. We actually need to now develop 
a plan of attack. We have a time window, only 45 seconds, then, unfortunately, uh, yes, the fog gets angry. And we need to send everyone in and actually give them a route and a thing to search. Now, what we also need to think about is what each room is, because things are where you expect them to be. If I want to ransack food, then there's a kitchen there. You will find food in that kitchen. Uh, for, let's see, what else have we got here? A bathroom, I'm not sure what those contain. If you want, like, supplies, like scrap, to make, like, defences on your train, you're going to be what, looking for storerooms. Um, if you want electronics, then look for kind of, like, you know, showroom floors, for example, though there's none of those here. So let's have a look-see. So we're starting down here at point A, that's our start zone. So therefore, we can run straight in the door, and these rooms around here are relatively accessible. So we're probably going to be wanting to get in here, grab what we can out of these rooms, and then go. Like, storage over here, not really worth it. This room back here is just, like, a complete bloody no-go, this storage room as is that factory floor. Though the factory floor would be an excellent place, presumably for like electrical components, for example. So before we decide who's going where, there's another thing we need to figure out, which is we can activate the radar to see where are the people, because we were told there were a large number of survivors in this building. In fact, if we go back to the location, there are six survivors present. So the radar shows me where my people are. They're gonna be kind of deployed there. And then the blobs are the survivors. Though we don't know whether each of those blobs represents one, two, or three survivors. Because that's... Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. There could be... Like, each of those could be one, and then one of them's worth three. Or, like, any other kind of combination, as long as it adds up to six. We don't know. Those blobs are just a group of survivors. So let's just put that onto our plan there. So they're in rooms, what? I, J, and C. So we might be able to get three, three, well, we could get a maximum of five survivors out if there happen to be five survivors up here and just one up in that storage room. So that's good. And then we've just got to check how bad the fog is. The fog is quite bad, but the fog is actually at its worst on the factory floor and not so bad elsewhere. Um, yeah, the factory floor, that's really bad fog. So in other words, if people get caught in there, They'll run into problems, they'll confront their own nightmares, they'll go mad, they'll become one of the fearless, and we'll lose them, we'll never see them again. That storeroom on the side is pretty safe. That room J, that kitchen, is actually pretty safe. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy Janet Jackson to guard, because we know she's very good at guarding. That means she gets a big radius to guard in. Guarding does two things. People on my team who are within her guard area are less likely to go mad and run off screaming into the night never to be seen again, which is good. And two, survivors within that area, within the rooms that she's covering, will basically, she'll shout out to them and they'll actually follow her out. So we need to move her to here. The problem, oh bloody hell, that's a... <laughs> so in order to move in and move back out, she needs 41 seconds. And then we can set how long she's guarding for. The problem is, not very long. I think we might not be able to get her round there, in fact. Uh, we might just need to do a smaller guard, just based on, like, her going to here rather than going all the way around the corner. So she goes to, can we just get into the kitchen? Can we just get into the kitchen? 45 seconds, okay. She moves 36, she moves in 15 seconds, she guards 15 seconds, she moves back out 15 seconds. So she's now guarding that area, okay? So her role is now set. Now we need to assign the others. Let's assign our most powerful individuals next. So Mildred Campbell, team leader, is our best searcher, which means her search radius is big. Though if I show you her guard radius, it's a lot smaller. She's not as good at guarding. So we'll kind of uh, just kind of put that out. But instead, now if we put her into searching, she's good at searching. So she can be searching multiple rooms at once too. So I ideally want to move her to about here so that she kind of can just kind of quickly run between those rooms, grabbing anything that happens to be there. Now I'm hoping that's going to be a 30, ooh, 36 seconds. That only gives her 10 seconds to search. It's going to have to do. She just it, This is just going to have to be a smash and grab raid. Um, but I think everyone else should actually be able to search, which is good, because we only really need her to be on the guard duty. So the other person that was good at searching was uh, Sanchez. So he's also going to search. But he's going to go around this way and try and clear out this, what's that, that bathroom and that large office. That's all he's going to be doing there. So if we just move him to like here, and that should be, so that's 43 seconds to get there. Blimey, Sanchez. Sanchez is going to run right here because you kind of, 
The system kind of is a bit weird because like if you can get him into a location he's allowed to search but like even if I make him stand here he searches these two rooms because they're within the effective area because it's like it's within the um little star that's off his thing. I don't know we have to assume there's like windows or he breaches the walls because breaching is an ability that people have so I guess like he takes a stick and he batters through the wall because it's a thin wall or something anyway he gets there in 26 seconds which means he's got more time to search so he's got 15 seconds to search in that area all right meanwhile ross is just going to search up here and smith is now just going to go and i think he's just going to help loot the rooms that we've already kind of found really actually you know what he's going to go for the kitchen and just try and get the food if he can just get over to that area and he can just stick around for five seconds um yeah he just sticks around for five seconds and there we go so we confirm that. So now we've set everyone's movement to go in here. They're all being protected by Janet Jackson. So it should all work absolutely fine. They just run in. They smash and grab. They get back out again before the fog becomes a problem. So we've got 45 seconds roughly before everything goes to hell. So obviously if we had like if the fog was really like much thinner. We might have like anything up to like a minute and a half. And we could have like sent one person purely up to the top just to grab the survivors up here. We're going to have to leave them because otherwise it would be too dangerous. So now we can start the mission, but before we do, we have to state what order things are important to us. So I'm going to say food's most important, fuel is of secondary importance, resource is of tertiary importance, and medical supplies I'm not worried about so much for now. So we confirm, and this is when the game gets awesome because of the way it handles this, which is you watch the radar live. And you can see time ticking down, and the fog counter there, time there, the radar there. The radio, because they'll start sending messages back to you through the radio as you're going. So we're going to send these people out here. I'm here to rescue you. That'll be Janet Jackson yelling to these people. So they're following Janet Jackson. Found some supplies, machine parts. Found a lot of machine parts. Found some scrap. Found some electronics. Good. So this is all good. So the um, you can see there that the survivors are already running for it. We've got, we're almost out of time, but my team have basically run in, grabbed whatever the hell was to hand, and now they're getting the hell back out again. Because they're all green at the moment, so everything's fine because they are not in a dangerous situation. Time's about to run out, but they'll be done in a second. Yep, they're into red, but everyone out the door in a hurry. Time's run out. And they are... There we are. Factory's been searched. They should have all made it back nice and safely. They send me a quick note, a crystal quick report there. So, fog level is at 100%. We just need to get the hell out of here. Nobody died. Um, everyone survived. We were in there for 51 seconds total. So what we did was we basically brought a food container, some machine parts, loads of machine parts, loads of scrap. So they basically brought in a load of uh, resources. They actually discovered 30. And uh, yeah, they brought back 10. Because yeah, the hauling capacity is limited. Like um, one of the blokes had more hauling than the rest of them. But like you can only bring back a certain amount. Which is that's what the prioritization is for. Because if like, they like find like 10 of everything, they'll just bring back the thing that you told them to bring back. So yeah, they brought back a load of scrap of machine parts and a tiny bit of food. So that is the factory searched. Beautiful. So that's how it all works. So that was a really kind of small, simple one. Because the, the fog was so thick. So with that done, we now have to figure out where we're going next. And where we're going next is obviously ne straight on to the next town. We've still not got much fuel, to be honest, though. Though, interestingly, one thing kind of worth noting is um, if we go slow or medium to the next town, it still gets, it still uses two fuel, whereas um, it also brings us in at a really good time. 7 a.m. is a great time to arrive. So we may as well set off going at medium speed because that will simply mean that we get there one day earlier but use the same fuel. So that's fine. I mean, we could go fast. We should get there a day earlier. But the day earlier would bring in at 7 p.m. And you can't work at 7 p.m. So we'd basically just be sitting in the town and then we'd only get going at 7 a.m. on the 24th. There's literally no point. You get there. You start work at the exact same time. So kick them off and the train starts moving. And hopefully, as we move into new areas, the damn fog will clear. That, by the way, sorry, is actually an outpost, which we heard about on the radio, not the town we were going for. Uh, so yeah, not Montrose, which is where we're going to get our first kind of big choice. We're going to be going for this here town, uh, just for a little outpost. So that's fine. We'll get there in two days. But in the meantime, these guys can actually spend having... <laughs> even though they have actually just gone and... Wait, what the... Oh, yes, of course. Sorry, we picked up loads of survivors. 
I'd forgotten we picked up survivors. Oops, my mistake. Right, yes, yeah, sorry. Survivors, loads of people have now actually just joined our train. Lovely. So now we've got ten people on board. We survived. Oh, yeah, we actually rescued five people. Beautiful. So, yeah, five people are now aboard our, uh, are now actually aboard our train. And even though those people, those five people in carriage one, did actually just go on a dangerous mission out into the fog, where they sprint and rescued survivors and supplies, they do have to do their normal work that I assigned to them before we went on that expedition anyway. They now have to get on with upgrading the damn things. Now, what you will notice, however, However, is there are seven people in that carriage, but three people decided to be in their own carriage for some interesting reason. Let's just actually just pop this up and see. Hang on, uh, how much more capacity do we have? Do we have spare in the train? Uh, can't go more than that. That's good. Uh, that would reduce the engine charge. All right, fine. So that one's going to be at like uh, half charge. I might need to upgrade the battery soon. Carriage one has accepted people who it thinks are like them because the new people who have arrived. So like um. Uh, Jay Garson, I'm pretty sure that's a new person, has been except- oh, look at him! Oh, he's bloody amazing! Look at that hauling and that searching and that breaching. James Garcia, you are coming with me on my next expedition. And someone else who's new is, uh, White, Charles White. He's pretty good as well. Compare him to flipping Billy Sanchez, who came last time. Charles White's bloody amazing. All right, fine. This is uh, this is why it's a good idea to keep an eye on people as they arrive. Because, yeah, Michael Smith can basically just be relegated out of this team at this point. Next time we go, Janet Jackson's coming with us. Obviously, uh, Mildred can still come with us because she's still pretty good. But Charles White can come in, as can James Garcia. Beautiful. So moving over into carriage two, this is just three people over here. Ah, and this is why these people weren't allowed into carriage one. Because these people are a bit slightly Debbie Downers. They believe that what's going on is some sort of terrible, horrifying punishment. And me, 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 I'm so miserable about everything. We'll see who they kind of um, set up as their leader. But whoever sets up their leader will kind of pull them down into wherever he believes. It seems like this guy's... Oh, this... Ooh. Michelle Miller, you are damn good at upgrading. Excellent. We will we will give you some orders next time. We'll see what you how well you can upgrade things. But uh, hopefully that means you will also be good at upgrading. This is a, this is a good little set of trains so far. Beautiful. So also we also do actually need to keep an eye on the supplies because carriage two currently has zero cargo in it. So carriage one needs to therefore send some of their supplies over into carriage two. Though uh, there's not actually a huge amount of. Supplies. Let's just send... Oh, no, it's, we can't because it's uh, it's too late in the day for orders. Um, okay, we'll have to do that tomorrow. Guys, I promise I will send you some food because, like, these are now at this point separate tribes. Their cargo, which includes, like, food and medical supplies, is particular to the carriage it's in. They don't share unless you flipping order them to. So next turn, I need to remember to order carriage one to send over some food and some medical supplies. And also some uh, just some supplies so that they can actually start uh, doing some upgrades over in carriage two as well. So, all right, let's... Uh, we may as well kind of crack on now because at this point I can't give any more orders. So we may as well fast forward into the guard section, see if anything comes over on the radio. And if anyone's listening, many survivors still alive at the outpost. The outpost was where we're going anyway. And then the carriage upgrades one. Fuel capacity two is at 29.5%. Obviously, it's, you know, the second level capacity takes longer than the first. So it's going to take them a little longer to do. So in that case, let's just double check if anything new shown up on the map here. But it doesn't look like it. Nope. So in that case, we can simply head to bed. Just go down to our carriage at the end there. And sleep it off and see what happens overnight. Right, woken up, quiet night. This is good. Any new messages that came in on the radio overnight? Yes, something did. If anyone's listening, many survivors still alive at the outpost where we're going. Lovely. I think the outpost is still one day out, actually, uh, if I recall correctly. It's the 23rd today, and that is, yeah, we'll arrive first thing on the 24th. So today is a bit of a quiet day, but this is actually good, because if you look here... We're moving away from the fog. The fog is quieting down. So when we get to the outpost, we'll have more time to explore next time, which will be very, very good. And we've got a much better team to go exploring with. Anyway, time for the lottery, because now we need to figure out who's going to be doing work today. Well, I've put Michelle Miller and Richard Ross, who are like the two with some really good upgrading and repairing abilities, into the lottery. Rather than that, it's going to be auto-filled with just some random individuals. Yep, you three can just be randomly selected in a genuine lottery. So we dispatch that, and now we see what happens. Yep, the leader is still Mildred Campbell, and she, because when we sent them the orders, they had a nice little meeting, has pulled everyone to share her opinion. Meanwhile, over in uh, train two, ah, we've got a couple of 
Small scale injuries. What injured you? Because there was no... You didn't send me a message saying you got attacked overnight, but maybe you... These people... Yeah, these people are all new, so maybe they were injured when we picked them up. That's absolutely fine. So what we need to do then is... Actually, you know what we do need to do? We need to send the doctor over to help them. So Billy Sanchez, who's very good at treating injuries. What we need to do is we need to send him over to a different carriage. So Billy Sanchez needs to move from one to two. So he now shuffles over. We've transferred Billy Sanchez over into uh, the second area. And that just seems to happen instantaneously. It doesn't seem to, like, cause you any kind of problem whatsoever. We also need to transfer some cargo over. So we need to send over some scrap over to number two. Can we send more than one thing at once? No, you can only send one thing. So we're going to send some scrap from one to two. We're going to send uh, some cargo, just some kind of machine parts from one to two as well. Yep. We're going to send them one bit of food so they can actually eat from one to two. And we're going to send them some uh, medical supplies from one to two. And as far as I can tell, that doesn't seem to use up any, because like, that's a really easy, quick, easy thing to do. So all of that cargo has now immediately shuffled over, which is very, very good. And now we've got this bloke. The thing we need to be careful of here is if the leader is more of the Debbie Downer, we're being punished sort, that might pull him down to believe that as well. So we need to be careful about that. We also need to potentially build them a little bit of defense. Let's have a look-see at their dream log. They're scared of shamblers and old Daisy? I don't even know what old Daisy is, but they're... There was doing the laundry as an old woman. She looks ancient, a raised finger. My joints are sore. Don't let her see. You'll end up like her. Ah, and they're scared of old age. Interesting. They're also scared of shamblers, limping, shambling, people are screaming, so they're scared of zombies. So we need to protect them against the shamblers, or at least provide them with defences that when the folk manifest physically as shamblers means they can reasonably defend themselves. So, let's get them to do that. They're scared of shamblers, and they've got some scrap. So we could put barred entrances, chained entrances, slaughter trap, blimey, identify barriers, or fireworks, okay? So we'll, we will build them some defences against, uh, yeah, we'll build them some defences against shamblers. So they can build that, and these guys like building defences and repairing the carriage, so they'll like me for that, and they've instantly gone into being defensive of me, so the train is very happy with my management so far. So you know what, I think we'll just let them get on with that. Over here, however, we can do some upgrading, though they are actually in the middle of... Yeah, they're still in the middle of upgrading the fuel capacity one, so we'll actually leave them doing that for the moment. Though over here in two, we can also get them to upgrade the... Yeah, do some upgrading to the radio. Let's get the radio a little bit better. So I'm dispatching that to them as well. They are okay at doing upgrades, but it's not their favourite thing in the world. So I'd rather focus on letting the engine upgrades be done by carriage one. Alright, so that there is the work details all assigned. Beautiful. Six to four, ten people on our train. May as well fast forward and see if anything interesting comes over the radio. Not there, let's try again. Through to the end of the day. Oh, 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 yeah, lots of stuff. Heather Rodrigue, ooh. Okay, so we just saw something new kind of show up there, although first there's a message come through the thing. Uh, fuel press. Oh, look at that. Because I assigned um, the really good, I think her name was Maria Miller, to doing the um, the upgrades, the fuel capacity, which was only done 29% on the first day, has now jumped to 64%. The Radio 2, however, is only at 12.6% because only a few people are doing it and they're not very good at upgrading. So, carriage one, carriage one, carriage one. You guys are awesome and I love you. Right, so now we need to go over to here because we've had some new things come through, some new messages. So, if anyone's listening, many survivors alive at the warehouse, yep. Few survivors alive at the restaurant at Harrison. Okay. Uh, you don't need to remember that, by the way, because when you rock up to a place, it flags all the relevant messages you've received for it. And Heather Rodriguez has certain talents. She's hiding at the factory in the kitchen. Now, that's very useful. That's very useful to know, because I've never actually found one of these people before, but I suspect... Is that the factory I'm about to come out to? No, that's this factory up here. So that's, uh, that's that factory. So if we get up to there, there's a special person in there. So this is now 7am on the 24th, it's the 23rd today. We're already to guard duty, so we may as well sleep off the rest of the night. Lovely. And the fog is falling very quickly, so we're going to have a nice low fog day tomorrow. Beautiful. Go to sleep. Everyone's got the defences they want. Everyone should hopefully have a nice quiet night, because we've got good defences against clowns, good defences 
against... Uh-oh. I'm having a nightmare. I'm having a nightmare. Hello. Yep. Hello. We're lovely. Everything's fine. I'm having a nightmare about cockroaches. It's fine. This isn't really happening. I don't think this has an impact on the game at all. This is just what you dream of. Um, though I think sometimes, like, if you have that nightmare, it means something's more likely to have gone wrong in the train. So let's check the messages. Ah! So, an injury treated by Michael Smith and a medical, um, yeah, medical issue. Medical resources have been used. Uh-oh. What went wrong in carriage one? Was there an attack? Attack by the pods! We were fit and healthy. Unbelievable. The carriage doesn't have any defences. Uh, Michael Smith and Janet Jackson worked well together. Damage was heavy. <sighs> That's not good. But nobody died. Okay, so the pods, whatever the hell the pods are, just attacked. And some people are now injured. How badly? Oh, not badly. Oh, you're a little bit bad. Oh, that's a shame. You're one of the people I actually wanted to... Oh, darn it. Both of the people I was about to... Flipping Daniel Radcliffe's injured as well. Um, that's a shame. Um, well, never mind. We'll have to, we'll have to send them anyway. Because we can't afford to wait. We're actually right now... We are, yeah, right at this very second, we're about to send people into a factory, so we're just going to have to, we're just going to have to make do. So the pods have injured three, and the damage is heavy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there is quite a lot more of this that I would really like to show you, and this video's got quite long already. So, I'm going to call it a part there, and I'm going to call this a double bill. Coming tomorrow, second part of the fear equation, because there's enough in this game that it really deserves to be looked at in quite a bit of detail. We will go to the factory, and then we will move on to that town, and we will properly explore a big town thing and see how we can do there. So that's tomorrow. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd, and this has been the really rather excellent fear equation. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Okay, now I don't want to be insensitive right now, but the best thing you can do is stamp on her head until it's mush. Get the gun. No, 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 do not just walk past the gun. Oh, yeah, the door with the bloody handprint on it. That's going to go well. Eleanor, come on. Eleanor, where the hell are you? Oh, God, you're the worst person ever.